just just been a just been a very good Sunday. Uh, you can't imagine today I woke up at 4 a.m. Just to remind me, I'm going to read the scriptures today. So, <laughs> so today uh, I'm going to read uh, our testimony. There's Samuel 16. Uh, Samuel did what the Lord said. He arrived at Bethlehem. The elders of the town met him. They were traveling with fear. They asked, Have you come in peace? So someone prayed, Yes, I have come in peace. I have come to offer a sacrifice to the Lord. Set yourself apart to him and come to sacrifice with him. Then he said, Yes, and he sang apart to the Lord. He invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, someone saw him. He thought this has to be one the Lord wants to wants me to anoint for him. But the Lord said to someone, Do not consider how handsome or tall he is. I have not chosen him. I do not look at the things people look at. Man looks at how some, someone appears from outside, but I look at what is in the heart. The just called for a being a dove. His heart came up in front of someone, but someone said, The Lord has not chosen him either. The just had Shama walk by, but someone said, The Lord has not chosen him either. The just had seven of his sons walk in front of someone, but someone said to him, The Lord has not chosen any of them. So he asked, Just, Are those the only sons you have? No, just answer. My youngest son is, talk, is taking care of the sheep. Someone said, send for him. We won't sit down to eat until he arrives. So he sent for his son and had, had him brought in. His skin was tanned. He had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, get up and anoint him. He is the one. So someone built the animal of, of horn that was filled with olive oil. He anointed David in front of his brothers. From that day on, the spirit of the Lord came on David with his power. Someone went back to Amen. Uh, New Testament, Acts 4. There were no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them. They brought the money from the sales. They put it down at the apostles' feet. It was then given out to anyone who needed it. Joseph was a Levite from Cyprus. The apostles called him Barnabas. The name Barnabas means son of help. Barnabas sold the field he owned. He brought the money from the sale. He put it down at the apostles' feet. A man named Ananias and his wife, Sapphira, also sold some land. He kept part of the money for himself. Sapphira knew he had kept it. He brought the rest of it and put it down at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, why did you let Satan fill your heart? He made you lie to the Holy Spirit. You have, cut, you have kept some of the money you received for the land. Didn't the land belong to you before it was sold? After it was sold, you could have used the money as you wish. What made you think of doing such a thing? You haven't lied to just anyone. You've lied to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. All who heard what had happened were filled with fear. Some young men came and wrapped up his body. They carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, the wife of Ananias came in. She didn't know what had happened. Peter asked her, Tell me, is this the price you and Ananias sold the land for? Yes, she said, it's the price. Peter asked her, How could you agree to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, you can hear the steps of the man who buried your husband. They are at the door. They will carry you out also. At that very moment, 
So he fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in. They saw that the Sapphira was dead. So they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. The whole church and all who heard about these things were filled with fear. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you to those who read. That was a very good reading of that story about Ananias and Sapphira and also about Samuel and David. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Pastor Don Eichens. Um, I introduced myself last week, but there are some new people here. So I'd just like to... Maybe I should turn this off. It's off. It is off. Oh, yeah. Let's put it down. Um, I would like to just, just introduce myself a little bit. I come from the United States, from the great state of Minnesota where we have very cold winters, but beautiful summers. So if you ever get an opportunity to come to America and visit Minnesota, don't come in the winter, come in the summer, okay? Um, just wanna uh, say thank you uh, to Walmart and to Rosemary. Uh, you guys have really shown me uh, hospitality this week. And uh, I just wanna, wanna uh, say that uh, Rosemary and Walmart have a gifting of hospitality. That's inviting people into their home, offering them a place to stay, offering them refreshment in the Lord. And so as they have done that uh, for me this week, I just want to acknowledge your pastors have that grace and that gifting flowing through them. Also, some of you have also uh, shown me great hospitality while I've been here. And I can see that um, their hospitality is an example to you. Um, just like uh, Paul said, in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And I believe we would all do well to uh, follow Rosemary and Waldemar's example of hospitality uh, and, and uh, show uh, hospitality to those around you. Now, before we look at the God's Word this morning, I would like to look at another verse to Psalm 119. And like I said last week, Psalm 119 is not only the, only the longest psalm in, the, in the, the psalms, but it's also the longest chapter in the Bible. And every single verse, I, I believe there's 179 verses, talks about a love and a, a uh, honor for the Word of God. And psalm 119, 105 says, Your Word is a lamp for my feet and a light to my path. And that's a very well-known verse in Psalm 119. But just think if God had not given us His Word. What if he left it up to all of us to try to figure out right from wrong? We'd all be stumbling around, wouldn't we? And we'd live our lives pretty frustrated because everybody else wouldn't know what's right from wrong either. But God has given us his word. And here it says that his word is a lamp and a light to show us the way to go. So please join me right now as we pray together as before we read God's word and, and, and look at God's word, that we ask him to help this to be a light for our past and a lamp upon our feet so we'll know which way to go as we read his word. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your word. Your word is a light to our field, a lamp for our path, God, that you are the one who shows us the way to go through your word. And as we look into your word today, Father, will you speak to each of us? Lord, I pray that each of us came today in, in, I, I, in, in a state, Lord, some of us are rejoicing, some of us are in need, some of us are in between, but Father, would we all leave changed by your word today? Would we all leave changed by your Holy Spirit? May not one of us who hears your word, I pray it doesn't fall to a hard, under the hard ground, but Lord, I pray that it would fall onto a, a, a good soil. Lord, that your word would be planted in our hearts and produce what you want. And we would know today clear what's ahead of us, how you want us to live our lives. For your glory, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so this week we're going to be looking at a very sobering story in the book of Acts, chapters, uh, cha cha chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce two important Bible study terms to you. So that uh, you'll know whenever we look at a story like this, we need to see it in, in, in a certain way. And uh, we need, uh, whenever we read uh, and study a story in the Bible, 
we need to look at it, whether it's a descriptive story or whether it's a prescriptive story. So I put the words up there on, on, on the uh, screen. What I mean by this is a descriptive story of the Bible contains uh, descriptions of various people and actions or events, but Christians aren't given the direct command to follow their example. A lot of times it's told so that we'll take it as an example or as even a warning. And I believe today uh, this story is a warning to us as Christians. But the prescript prescriptive parts of the Bible are direct commands that we're to follow as Christians. Um, they're prescribed for us to follow. And a good example of this would be uh, the four times in the New Testament, I forgot to quote this one, but the four times in the New Testament uh, where it says that we're to show hospitality. Uh, it says it in Romans, in 1 Timothy, Hebrews, and 1 Peter. And this command directly shows us or prescribes for us how to live as Christians. So Acts 5, 1 through 11 is a descriptive section of the Bible that, that happened once in church history, and it is obviously written to us as a warning as Christians, uh, and it's been written to Christians throughout history, uh, including us gathered here, here this morning. And I'm actually excited to look at this in more detail with you because it deals with a very dangerous sin that we as Christians need to avoid. And it focuses on the Holy Spirit's role in keeping everyone in the church free from this sin. Now, like I said last week, verses 34 and 37 in chapter 4 really set up the drama that's going to happen in chapter 5, 1 through 11. Let me encourage you, if you re usually read the Bible one chapter at a time, chapter 1, one day, then chapter 2, the next day, chapter 3, uh, sometimes you miss out on the flow of the chapters. So let me encourage you, if that's the way that you study the Bible, every day before you read the next chapter, read a few verses uh, from the chapter before so that you see some of the things uh, that flow into the next chapter. Because this is really, uh, I, I believe that uh, chapter, the last cha few verses in chapter 4 tell us about Barnabas. And the next uh, uh, story in chapter 5 tell us about Ananias and Sapphira. And what Luke, the writer of this story, wanted us to see was a comparison between the two. And, and he encourages us to be like Barnabas and to avoid being like Ananias and Sapphira. So starting in verse 34, we read, There was not a needy person among them, among the believers. For as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold the field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So like we discussed last week, when we looked at chapter 4, there were several good fruits, good results that came from all the believers being filled with the Holy Spirit. We read that just a few verses before these, these verses, that all the believers were filled with the Holy Spirit. And it, it appears that the believers were so immersed in the Holy Spirit that many of them were willing to sell houses and lands and give that money to those who were in need in the church. I mean, that's really being immersed in the Holy Spirit. Now that must have been quite a witness to those who watched the church in those days. And I believe it was a very powerful manifestation of the love Jesus commanded his disciples to have for one another when he commanded them in John 13, 34, and 35 to love one another. Now I remember a similar example of this beautiful love in the international church that my wife and I had a chance to pastor in Morocco. It was really amazing. We have, we have people from 25 different nations in our church, from every walk of life. Some were very well off financially. Some were very poor financially. Some had a high edu education. Some didn't have much of an education. But on a Sunday morning, that didn't matter in our church because we were the body of Christ together. We were brothers and sisters together. And one day, a man from the local community walked in, and he was absolutely astonished to see people from North America 
in Europe, in Africa, in South America, in Oceania, and, and, and other in Asia, all interacting with one another like they were a family. All, all treating one another with honor and respect. And he said to he said, this wasn't to me, this is to one, one of our other pastors, he said, you know, just outside these doors, just outside these doors, that's not what's found. You don't want to find that kind of love here. You won't find people treating each other equally because it, it matters how rich you are. It matters how poor you are. It matters how much education you have. Outside the doors. But he said, inside here, I can't believe what I'm seeing. And it was his first time coming into a church. He had never been in a church before. And what a witness that must have been of the love of God. And I believe the early church had something even more powerful that was going on. But the love of God, when Jesus said, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And that's what they had in the early church. And that's what we tasted at our international church. So we see that one powerful manifestation of this love among the believers in chapter 4 was that many of those who owned lands and houses were willing to sell them to give the proceeds to help those who were in need. And it appears that, that those who were very generous in this way were held in high esteem among all of the believers. And it's kind of understandable, right? If somebody sold their house and gave it away or sold their lands, I mean, we'd be pretty impressed with them. And I believe this is one of the reasons Joseph was renamed Barnabas, son of encouragement. To encourage literally means to give courage to someone. And I think Barnabas gave courage to people to obey the Lord. And I'd say it would take a lot of courage to sell your house or to sell lands to give it away, wouldn't it? And Barnabas, Barnabas was the real deal. What you saw on the outside of Barnabas what was, was what was going on on the inside of Barnabas. He was generous. He was encouraging. And his generosity encouraged others to be generous as well. Now we read earlier, we read earlier in the Old Testament reading today, in 1 Samuel 16, 7, it says, And the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance. Oh boy, do we ever look on the outward appearance, don't we? We love celebrities, don't we? It's like, wow, the beautiful people. They must be have it all made. They must be so happy. Look at their smiling and they're beautiful. We look on the outward appearance, but what does the Lord look at? Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And let's keep this in mind as we start to read chapter, Acts chapter 5. It's, to me, one of the most difficult passages in the entire New Testament. And when Waldemar and Rosemary asked, hey, you guys want to preach on this? I'm like, well, Ananias and Sapphira? <laughs> you know? So um, this is, uh, I've learned a lot this week myself. But just so you know, pastors and preachers learn a lot when they read the Bible. And that's one of the reasons they love it. And so this was a challenging uh, scripture, but it's also very encouraging as we're going to see. At first, it's a little discouraging and sad, but we'll get there. So chapter 5 introduces us to two people, and they're evidently not quite the same as Barnabas. Verse 1, chapter, chapter 5. But a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Here it says that Ananias and Sapphira sold a piece of property just like Barnabas, but instead of bringing all of the proceeds, they held back a little bit of it, or a lot of it, and then they laid it at the apostles' feet. They only pretended that they had laid all of it at the apostles' feet. Now, why do you suppose they would have done something like that? To take back some of it and pretend to put all of it in front of the apostles' feet. Do they want the prestige of being seen by others as some of the most generous people in the church? I mean, perhaps that's what they did. Were they filled with grief for their own gain or maybe worried that there wouldn't be enough money for their own needs so they kept some of it back? That, that might have been the reason they did too. Were they half-hearted instead of wholehearted in their devotion to the Lord? Perhaps that was it. 
but doesn't really say what their motivation was. But one thing they were for sure is they were hypocrites. A hypocrite is simply a person who puts on a false appearance of zealous devotion to the Lord, or a person who acts in a contrary way to what they say they believe. The word hypocrite is actually derived from the Greek term, which means actor. It literally means a person who puts on a mask. That's not themselves. In other words, a hypocrite is someone who pretends to be what he or she is not. And Ananias and Sapphira clearly conspired to put on a false appearance here, didn't they? Of looking like they laid everything they got from the sale of their, their, uh, their land, uh, their property, at the feet of the apostles when they really hadn't. Now, now to understand what happens next in our passage in Acts chapter 5, we're going to just take a second here. It's very important to realize how Jesus viewed hypocrisy. And Matthew 23 gives us a, a front row seat to his interaction with the very people of his day who should have known best how to live a right relationship with the Lord, how to not be hypocrites. In Matthew 23, Jesus pronounces seven woes on the Jewish religious leaders of his day. Now, a woe here, and actually Waldemar helped me with this a little bit to understand this, a woe here, as Jesus is using it, is more an expression of deep grief or of pity or great concern, more so than anything like a curse. He wasn't cursing the religious leaders here by saying woe. He's just saying, ah, this grieves me so much. And it's important to realize that these seven woes are spoken by Jesus during the final week of his life, right before his crucifixion. And they come right after all of the religious leaders have asked him question after question after question after question to try to trap him into saying something so they could actually put him to death. So this is the highly charged thing. Jesus must have been exhausted dealing with all of these religious leaders, trying to trip him up. And he finally... Uh, his last answer, nobody else had anything else to say. They were done asking him questions. And this is when Jesus takes time to address the, the religious leaders. In Matthew 23, verses 13, it says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. And I'm not going to go verse by verse through what Jesus says, but this is what he, he, he began with this line, and he said it six times, and one time he said, You blind guy. But he give, begins with this to list their sins, one right after another. Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, and neither entering yourselves nor allowing ever anyone else to enter in. Jesus accused them of loving money more than God, and of neglecting justice and mercy and faithfulness. He rebuked them for looking clean on the outside, but for, but for being dirty on the inside. He revealed their hypocrisy of trying to appear righteous before others, while on the inside they were full of evil and lawlessness. And he then asked them this chilling question, which reveals the dire consequences of their hypocrisy. In Matthew 23, 33, Jesus says, You serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Now, I know this sounds harsh from Jesus, and it is. But rest assured, it is Jesus' love for these religious leaders and Jesus' love for all the people that he is motivated to actually say the things that he said, to tell them, uh, that, 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 to conf confront them with their sin of hypocrisy. And it is his love for them that actually motivated him to go to the cross for all of their sins and for all of our sins against him. So keeping Jesus' love in mind, let's go on and start to read chapter 5, verse 3. It says, But Peter said to Ananias, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not your, at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came upon all who heard him. 
The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him up and buried him. Wow. I don't know about you, but this is not an easy story to read at all, especially in the New Testament. But let me remind you again that this por portion of Scripture is a descriptive portion, and it's been written for all of us who believe in Jesus as a stern warning against hypocrisy. Peter said to Ananias, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Why is it you've con contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. So we see here that the sin of hypocrisy, the sin of putting on a false appearance of being virtuous, of zealous devotion to the Lord, is, not, is actually not just lying to people, but it's actually lying to the Holy Spirit. This is the sin that Jesus was most grieved about in the religious leaders, and this is the sin that he wants all of his people to most ardently avoid, to do everything you can to not be a hypocrite, but to be true to the Lord, the inside matching the outside, and the outside matching the inside. Matthew 23, 1 through 3 comes right before the seven woes. And it, said, and it says that Jesus said to the crowds and his disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. That means they're the teachers. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you. They read the scriptures. And, and so do, Jesus said, do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. So here's a further definition of hypocrisy given by Jesus himself to preach and teach something that you do not practice yourself, that you not, do not live by, you do not practice what you preach. You know, we have all heard of great and popular Christian leaders who have preached and taught the Bible over the course of many years, maybe many decades, to many people. And, they, and, and I don't know about you, but every time oh, and, and, and we preach many people and then who have been discovered to not be practicing what they preach. And I don't know about you, but every time I hear of a Christian leader who falls like this, my heart is grieved for them and for everyone involved who's been hurt and betrayed and really traumatized by the hypocrisy of somebody they believe in and thought that they could trust to do what they said they would do and what they, they preached. I'm also grieved that the name of God is often ridiculed when this happens. And many people say, see, it doesn't matter if you believe in God or not. All Christians are hypocrites. And I believe when we as Christians do not practice what we profess to believe in, it weakens our witness in, in the world. And it weakens our bond together as the, as the body of Christ because what happens when we break trust? It's hard to restore that trust. It takes time to restore that trust. I believe this is why Jesus dealt so harshly with hypocrisy in the religious leaders and why the Holy Spirit dealt so harshly with Ananias here in the book of Acts. And as, to put, and as if to put a double emphasis on the importance of this warning against hypocrisy, we read the continuing sad story of Ananias' wife, Sapphira. Verse 7, At an interval, after an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, How is it that you, you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she, she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Now Sapphira suffers the same judgment as Ananias, even though she was not the one to come up with plan. Ananias came up with this evil plan, didn't he? It really seems unfair that she should have to suffer the same fate. But I believe we can learn something really important here about what happened to Sapphira. Her big mistake was not coming up with a sinful idea, but her big mistake was that she went along and followed Ananias' evil plan. 
Now, a lot can be said here about how important it is for leaders to lead rightly, and leaders will be held to a higher accountability. That's for sure. But as God's people, we need to be ready to question others, especially if they come up with bad ideas, ideas that are contrary to the Word of God and evil plans. Just think if Sapphira had said no to Ananias' plan. What if she had said, Ananias, I love God too much to lie to him. I love our leaders at the church. I love the people at our church too much to lie to them. And I love you, Ananias, too much to let you go through with this evil plan. I'm not going to agree to do this. You know, I think we probably wouldn't have heard about Ananias and Sapphira, but if we did, if, this, if, if she had refused to go along with uh, uh, Ananias' plan, I believe if we did hear about them, it would have, they would have gone down in biblical history in a much more positive light. And it's too bad Sapphira didn't speak up. And she paid for it with her very life. And I think it's important to notice that Peter said to Sapphira, how is it you have, you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Agreeing with others when they make plans that are against the Lord, against the word of the Lord, enables them to go forward with their sinful plans. But disagreeing with others when they make evil plans discourages them from carrying those evil plans forward. And we all, no matter who we are in the church, we are to spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not toward selfishness and evil deeds. In Hebrews 10, 24-25, it says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as we see the day approaching, the day when Jesus will return. And it's a lot closer today than it was 2,000 years ago when this was written by the writer of Hebrews. May we each be encouragers of others in the church to love and to do good and to avoid evil, especially the evil of hypocrisy. Peter asked Sapphira, how is it that you agree together to test the spirit of the Lord? Hypocrisy tests the spirit of the Lord, much like the religious leaders tested Jesus the week before his crucifixion, with all their disingenuous questions, questions that were asked not because they wanted to know, but because they wanted to trip him up and trap him. Hypocrisy is a challenge to the authority of God and his word in our lives, as we choose not to trust the Lord in his word, but to do things our own way. Because sometimes, actually a lot of times, following Jesus is not the easiest route to take. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is the antidote to hypocrisy. Like a medicine that works to get rid of poison in your body. And I believe each of us would do well to apply this verse to our lives every day. And it will help us to become more like Barnabas in this story. And avoid becoming hypocrites like Ananias and Sapphira. Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. So when you face difficulties you don't know how to handle, trust in the Lord and His Word. When you have a conflict in a relationship, maybe with your spouse or your child or with someone else, and you don't know how, what to do about it, trust in the Lord and His Word, and He will lead you through that. When you look at your future or when you regret your past, trust in the Lord and follow His Word, and He will direct your paths. You will never go wrong trusting in the Lord and His Word. Finally, we read in our passage today that after everyone heard about what had happened to Ananias and Sapphira, Great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard these things. Now I know we all like to think of Jesus as a gentle and compassionate uh, teacher and savior, you know, patiently teaching his disciples, leading the 99 sheep to go look for the one sheep who was lost. And for sure, Jesus is a loving and compassionate 
shepherd and savior. But it is safe to say that Jesus was also willing to speak the truth into our lives through his word. Because by knowing the truth, by only, only by knowing the truth can sinners, just like us all here, only by knowing the truth can sinners be set free from their sins. Listen to what Jesus said to the church of Laodicea. And I emphasize the word church because a lot of times this, these verses come up when we're talking to somebody about receiving Jesus for the first time. But just think about this. Listen to what Jesus said to the church of Laodicea in chapter 3 of the book of Revelation. Uh, verse 14. To the angel of the church of Laodicea, right? These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. It sounds pretty harsh. Let's go to verse 19. Those whom I love, I rebuke. Jesus didn't love you. He wouldn't rebuke you. He wouldn't give you the truth. He would let you just wander in the darkness without anywhere to go. But he loves you. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. I'll have fellowship with them and they will have fellowship with me. But like I said, the scripture is usually used when you're telling somebody how to receive Christ for the first time. Open up your heart to Jesus. And that's true. It's a great verse for that. But I believe it was written as an invitation for every Christian to practice every day. Am I opening the doors of my heart to Jesus? And am I inviting him inside? Not trying to look just good on the outside, but inviting him inside to have fellowship and to change me by his Holy Spirit. When we have fellowship with Jesus, when we're reading his word, when we're in prayer, we may not know it, but Jesus is changing us. He's changing us to become more and more like him. And that's his desire. In our, in, in, a, in our lives. Now I'd like to take a moment to pray together for all of us here. And lead us through a prayer of repentance with any hypocrisy in our lives. And let me rest assured, if you're wondering if there's any hypocrisy in your life, there is, okay? And God, God realizes that. You know what God wants to do? He wants you to confess it. And he wants to wash it away by the power of, of the shed blood of Jesus by the washing of the Holy Spirit and, and His Word in your life, okay? So we're going to take a little time. I'd ask everybody to stand up. and we're, I'm just going to pray a prayer of repentance. And we're going to also take time to ask Jesus to do this wonderful redemptive work in our lives. So it's going to take a minute. I'm going to have a time of quietness as we uh, just repent of anything that the Lord brings to mind. And this is a wonderful time. But Jesus is never shame, shame, shame. But Jesus is come, come, I want to take that which is getting the way out of the way. And I want to bring myself into the midst of anything you're dealing with. So let's pray together. Father God, we thank you that you love us. We thank you that you sent Jesus as this wonderful picture that we get to see of your love for us. Lived out in human flesh. And thank you, God, for your rebuke. Thank you for your warning because you love us. You don't want any of us to be hypocrites. And so, Lord, right now we're going to take just 10 seconds, 15 seconds, and each one of us just confess before you any area of hypocrisy in our lives. And would you reveal it, and would you come, and would you cleanse us of it, forgive us of it, and then fill us with your Holy Spirit. Lord, would you speak to us now? Father, as we confess to you any hypocrisy, would you wash it away now with the wonderful power of the shed blood of Jesus? Would you wash it away by the 
the, the flowing of your Holy Spirit in our life, would you fill us, God, to overflowing? Would you do your redemptive work? Would may all of us here not be hypocrites? May we live what we believe. May we be the same on the outside as we are on the inside, and the same on the inside as we are on the outside, that we would we be like Jesus. Lord, we invite you, we open up the doors of our hearts, we invite you in, and may each of us have wonderful, close, rich fellowship with you now, throughout this day, and throughout the rest of every day of our life, may we always open up the doors of our hearts to you, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may have a seat. I'm not, I'm not done yet. Yeah, yeah. It, it, and if, am I going too long? No. Okay, great, great. I sometimes do stop because I, I want to, there's certain parts of the sermon that I want to pray, pray into us and not, not I miss that opportunity. Sorry about that. I should include you in what I wanted to do here. So, I'm going to take, this is going to be the last portion of my sermon, but we're going to zoom out now. We've zoomed in. Jesus has really dealt with the heart, right? We're going to zoom out a little bit and talk about the spiritual warfare that took place in this story of Ananias and Sapphira. Because I want you to be aware of an invisible character in this story. Not mentioned, but he's definitely there. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthian church. He was dealing with another issue. This is really important. Another reason I wrote to you was to see if you would stay on the test and be obedient in everything in order that Satan might not outwit, might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. While we as Christians should not be too focused on the devil and, and give him undue attention, or attention that's not necessary, we should not be unaware of his schemes and his plans. The devil was surely at work in Ananias and Sapphira to try to slow down the progress of the gospel, the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the growth of the church. Up to this moment, the church, other than when Peter and John were questioned before the religious leaders, the growth of the church has just been going like this. And I believe that one of the reasons this happened was to try to slow down that growth of the church Try to get the gospel to stop. Some have compared the story of Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts to the story of a man named Achan found in the book of Joshua, chapter 7. The story about Achan occurs at the time when the Israelites had recently crossed the Jordan River into the Promised Land and God had given them their first military victory over the sinful city of Jericho. And God had commanded Joshua, the new leader of the Israelites, to command the people... Be careful not to take anything from Jericho, not one little thing from Jericho for themselves, but to, in Joshua 6, 18 through 19, but to keep away from the devoted things so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron from Jericho are sacred to the Lord and must be brought must go into his treasury. So Joshua made it very clear that no one was to take anything from Jericho for themselves. But a man named Achan secretly took some, things, some of these things for himself. Now his sin was not discovered until after Israel went up against another evil city to destroy it. But instead of the Lord giving them victory, Israel was soundly defeated. So Joshua falls on his face before the Lord, and the Lord reveals, eventually reveals that it was Achan who had taken some of the devoted things. And that's the reason why the whole nation of Israel was under the judgment of God. So Joshua confronts Achan, and Achan confesses his sins, coveting silver and gold that he had taken, and told Joshua and his men where it was inside his tent. Sadly, like the story of Ananias and Sapphira, Achan paid for his sin with his life. But even sadder than this, Achan's whole family and everything he owned was also put to death and destroyed along with Achan. Both the story of Achan and the story of Ananias and Sapphira, an act of deception, an act of hypocrisy, interrupts the victorious progress 
of the people of God. The sin of Achan occurs early in Israel's military progress into the promised land, and the sin of Ananias and Sapphira occurs early in the church's progress in spreading the gospel in Jerusalem. And who would be interested in stopping the progress of the gospel being spread in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth? That would be the devil himself. We as Christians need to be aware of the devil and his schemes and to guard ourselves against hypocrisy, which he has tried to tempt others with throughout thousands of years of human history. Tempting people to be hypocrites is his tactic. It's his scheme. Some have resisted hypocrisy and have overcome the devil and the power by the power of the Holy Spirit gives them in their life, while some, like Achan and Ananias and Sapphira, have been overcome by the devil through their own hypocrisy. But praise the Lord, God doesn't leave us defenseless against the devil and his schemes. Actually, he gives us every single weapon we need to overcome the devil and his schemes. He has set us free to live for him by the power and death of his resurrection. By the power of his death and resurrection. And by the power of his Holy Spirit and his word in our lives. Ephesians 6.11 says, Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. And we don't have time to go through this in detail, but let me just run through this armor real quick. In the following verses, Paul goes on to write, and I encourage you to read this scripture this week, uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 20. We have the belt of truth buckled around our waist. We have the breastplate of his righteousness set in place. We have our feet fitted with shoes that we can run fast with the good news of Jesus. We have a shield of faith that can extinguish every single arrow that the enemy tries to send us, at us. We have the helmet of salvation when we know where we're going to go. We're protected. Doesn't matter what happens to us here, we will be with Jesus someday. And we have the sword of the Spirit. I love that. That's the only offensive weapon in the whole armor of God is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And we also get to pray in the Spirit on all occasions, on all kinds of prayers and requests. Truth, His righteousness, the gospel, faith in Jesus, salvation, the Word of God in prayer. These, with the help of the Holy Spirit, can guard our hearts from the sin of hypocrisy. He can help us to stand strong against the devil and his schemes and keep our hearts open to Jesus now and forevermore. Again, I'd encourage you to read Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10. And as you read it, don't just read it and study it. But use your imagination and imagine you're wearing all of that every day in the Lord. You're not a victim. You are a fully armed conqueror of God, and you can stand uh, against the devil and his schemes and live for Jesus. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much. Thank you, God. Lord, thank you for all that you, you do in our lives. Thank you that you want us to be the same on the inside as we are on the outside, and on the outside, the same on the inside. You want us to be like you. And I do pray, Lord, that each and every person here, you would give them victory, Lord. Victory not to, to just be on defense, Lord, but to go on offense, to stand strong, and to, to uh, withstand the devil's schemes, to withstand hypocrisy. And Lord, I pray that this would be a church that shines like Jesus, that every whoever looks at anybody who's a part of this church, they say, that's the real deal. That's a part of this. That's somebody who's encouraging people to live for Jesus. That's somebody who's generous. As somebody who loves the Lord and loves me. Pray your blessing upon us. I yes, I'm doing. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, this time. <laughs> I think we have the clue right here. So, one of the things we love to do is to hear what the Holy Spirit has been saying to you. And thank you for that word. I'm glad you were giving it. Uh, and. Uh, as you were talking, one of the reasons I was wanted to get up here because I was thinking, you know what? This is one of our high values that when we gather together, it's not as a group of perfect people. Amen. 
we know, Rosemary and I know, that we are broken. And we are so grateful for the opportunity to be a part of the body of Christ with you, knowing that we're flawed, but God still loves us. One of our great values, one of our sayings is, come as you are, don't leave as you are. So we pray that the Holy Spirit will work on you. But we want to hear what God has been saying to you. So what are your takeaways? My takeaway about hypocrisy is like humility. When you think you're humble, that's the time when you're not. <laughs> Same thing with hypocrisy. When you think you're not hypocrite, being a hypocrite, then you are. So, best thing is to confess and repent. Yeah. I learned that uh, our life is uh, transparent before the Lord because of the Holy Spirit. The part where uh, we are reminded that we are not victims, that God equips us with all the armor to combat the attack and the schemes of the devil. So sometimes we are afraid that, oh, I might lose this battle. I don't have the courage. And now, um, today, this morning, we are reminded that God has given us all these things. So we should be confident that whatever is the situation, be able to overcome. Uh, we are living in a complex system of life, so I realize the the danger of um, the danger of being hypocrite. So, uh, what do you think about if the being hypocrite is a condition? to be successful in our life. Thank you. I had something really interesting happen with my college roommate. She was nice, everybody liked her. But you know, most of us lie a little. Honestly, right? You say something because think it'll, it'll help you along. And the last time I met with her, we used to meet on Boxing Day, the day after Christmas, every year. That was Bonnie and my day. And one year she said, Rosemary, I just had a year. And I'm like, oh, what does that mean? Because she'd been through a lot. She said, I, did, I told the Lord I would only tell the truth. And I went like, oh boy. And you know what she said? People trust me. They know if they ask me, is this an ugly dress? She'll say, I don't really like it, but I love the color. <laughs> Does this suit me? If it doesn't suit them, she goes like, not really. But look for something that, you know, has a, a shift like, you know, she just, she decided to tell the truth. And I just remember being so convicted. And the Lord just saying to me, are you willing to tell the truth? And we're like, uh, I hope so. <laughs> right? The Lord is still working on me with that because we want to please people. Waldemar had someone in his Bible study who lost their job, had to transition jobs because he was not willing to tell a lie. And God is blessing him. We rejoice. We, we got to celebrate a couple of weeks ago in his new work. He is uh, experiencing success. And you know what? Sometimes when you stand for God, you, you don't, you know, get these great, great victories. But you know what? It's still worth it. Because ultimately, I have to live with myself. When I look in the mirror, what do I see? Do I see the liar? The hypocrite? Or do I see somebody who is willing to tell the truth? 
willing to stand for what's right. I want to be that person. And you know what? I've got to tell you, I don't want to be a hypocrite. God is still working on me. If you look at me and say, oh, he's got it all together. He's got, you know, this, this is an example. No, the best I can tell you is follow me as I follow Christ. And where I'm not following Christ really well, don't follow me. <laughs> and I'll try to tell you the truth when I mess up. I will. But, yeah? You know, it was interesting when I was, this is my personal takeaway. When I was sitting there, the Lord told me something last week that I did. It's, it's not a sin, but I promised for Lent I would give something up. And I didn't. And the Lord just said, nobody knows what me. But you promised you would fast this. But you are not. What's, you know, here we are. I'm just like, guilty. Fix that before you kill me. <laughs> right? And fix that before I am a barrier for the work of the Spirit. Give me an honest heart. Maybe you've made a promise to God. I will do this. I will do this for you. I won't do this. Keep your promises to God. Be honest. And you know, the Lord says, confess your sins. Remember we read this a few, a few weeks ago in James. Confess your sins so that you will be healed. Some of you need healing in your spirit. You may feel conviction. You need healing in your body. You need healing in your relationships. Confess your sins to one another that you may be healed. And we're going to go into communion now, which is a symbol of Jesus giving everything for us. His body was broken for our healing. His blood was shed for our forgiveness. And we're going to invite you, as we just bow our heads, to just give yourself again to God. Maybe it's the first time, maybe you've done this before. But let's come together and just say, God, if we're faking it, if we're lying, God's not going to be like, you are kidding. Oh, really? He's never going to, he already knows. You don't have to tell him except that you admit to yourself, I'm coming to you as you know me. I don't want to stay as I am. All right, so let's do that together. And we're going to invite our ministry team and our leadership team, the ones who are here, when we come forward for communion, we're going to invite them to take a little vial of oil to anoint you. If you need prayer, you need provision, just go see... Just go stand with one of them after you've taken the bread and the cup, and they will pray for you. Because we know we have many needs. Some of you need work, some of you need healing, some of you need just healing in a relationship, the way I already said. So let's just come to the Lord together, and they will come to the table. So let me explain. At uh, IES Bandung, we practice after <laughs> communion, which means that if you are a follower of Jesus, if, if you are on the path with him, you are welcome to partake. We don't have to know you individually. We're not gatekeepers. It's between you and God. You are welcome to come and join in this. And what's going to happen is I'm going to ask John and Grace, okay, if you will come and hold the, uh, the plates of the elements. And... And what's going to happen is Rosemary and I will read together the, the words that Paul gives us. But as, as you are, as you think and pray and so on, you will come up and John and Grace will say to you as you stand in front of them, his body broken for us, his blood shed for us. You'll take a piece of bread, you'll drink, dip it in the cup, and then you'll partake of that 
representing the body, the broken body, the shed blood of Christ. And then they will pass to you the tray so that you can serve the next person in line. Because we are the body serving each other. So, Paul tells us these words, I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So as you're ready, please come and participate. 